I'm going to work through a few examples of finding inverse functions. The first thing we need to talk about is the notation, though. So if f is my function, to write f inverse, we write f with an exponent of negative 1. And then it's a function, so we still follow it with our independent variable. So when we see this, we would say f inverse of x. And we have a restriction when we're looking for inverse functions, and that is the original function, f of x, must be 1 to 1. And 1 to 1 means that for each x, there's one y, and for each y, there's one x. Or that your function passes a horizontal line test. So 1 to 1, we will look at as passes a horizontal, as opposed to a vertical, line test. Okay, so our first three examples all fit this criteria, and the last one I'll show you what to do when f is not 1 to 1. Okay, so we know functions can come in a bunch of different ways, and one of the first ways you learn is as a set of ordered pairs. So here's my function. It consists of these three points, 1, 1, 2, 4, and 3, 9. If I'm looking for f inverse, it is what happens when we switch all of the x's and y's. So on my first point, it stays the same, because they're both 1's. But on my second point, the 4 and the 2 swap spots. And my third point, same thing. The 9 and the 3 swap spots. Okay. So what does an inverse function do exactly? Well, it undoes whatever it was that f did. So if it looks like, in this case, f says, for these three points at least, take what I give you and square it. Take what I give you and square it. Take what I give you and square it. It works for all those points. So if f squares, f inverse has to undo that, so that's a square root. So the square root of the input is 1. The square root of the input 4 is 2. Square root of the input 9 is 3. So it undoes what happened before. Okay. But when your function looks like a set of ordered pairs, you just swap them. Okay. Swap your x's and y's. Graphically, right, so if you have f of x as a graph and you're asked to find f inverse, the way you do that is the function, f inverse function, I'm drawing a dot in a line here, and I'm dotting in the line y equals x. Okay? Because inverse functions are reflected over this diagonal line y equals x. So f inverse is reflected, so fold it and do the symmetry, over y equals x. Now, let's see, this point here is 3, 1. So just like we did on that last example, on my inverse function, I would have the point 1, 3, so 1, 3. I know I've got that. And then I just have to kind of visualize what that would be if it folds over here. And it kind of looks like that for f inverse. Okay. Now, what you'll probably spend most of your time doing is actually finding a formula to compute f inverse. So let's say that f of x is given as an equation, and you are asked to find f inverse. Here are the two steps you need to do. First thing is swap your x's and y's. So you might not see the y explicitly here, but you understand it's right hiding here. So I have y equals that. So when I swap them, it will be x equals y minus 2 all over 5. Okay, so there's step one. Step two says solve for y. So now you have to remember everything you know about getting y by itself. So multiply both sides by 5. Cancel here. So now I have 5x equals y minus 2. Add the 2. I guess I have a final step, so this all here was step two. Step three is we just make it look nice. We use our inverse function notation. So replace this y here with your inverse function notation. f to the negative 1 of x, f inverse is 5x plus 2. Okay. I want to take just a second here before I go do that next thing. I'm going to squeeze it in right in here. Okay, I'm going to use that empty space. If you do composition, if you remember what that means, if I find 
f of f inverse of x. So if I do a composition of these two functions, okay, that means this whole function, this 5x plus 2 replaces this x right there, right? replaces that x. So I would have 5x plus 2 minus 2 all over 5. So the plus 2 minus 2 cancel, and you're left with 5x over 5, or x. That is always the case. If two functions are inverse, then evaluating one at the other, everything should cancel out except an x. Okay. All right, so these are the two steps. And then that last step is just making it look pretty with your notation. Doing a composition is a check. All right, last example. Let's say your function is not one-to-one. -one. So one-to-one -one is that horizontal line test. So the way you know, it's like, OK, well, let's see. I have x minus 1 squared plus 2, parabola, right 1, up 2. So we'll do just a quick sketch of f. And we get that. And we see that it, in fact, fails horizontal line tests all over the place. So what we do, instead of throwing up our hands and saying, ah, I can't do it, is we're going to go in and we're going to restrict the domain x values of f so that it is one to one. Okay. We're just going to cut it in half. And it really doesn't matter which half you take, but typically, right, we like to be positive. So we're going to take the right side for this example. So what domain is that? What set of x's start at the vertex and go to the right? Exactly. So the domain of f is going to be from 1 to infinity. Okay, That's my restriction. And then we're going to walk through those same two steps. Step 1, change your x's and y's. So now I have x equals y minus 1 squared plus 2. And the next step was to solve for y. Okay, here it is. So we have to start peeling off everybody who's harassing it. And you start from the outside and work in. So subtract the 2 from both sides. Okay, now I have to break the square. So we break squares with square roots. And I'm sure you've been told that if you decide to square root things, you have to remember your plus minus. We're going to get rid of one of them in just a minute. Wait for me. Okay, so we have a plus minus on one side. On the right side, I'm going to grab a different color because, right, the squaring and the square root ch -ch -ch cancel. So the right side becomes a nice and tidy y minus 1. Left side, not so tidy, plus or minus square root, x minus 2. But I'm one step to done, except for the prettying, and then we have some thinking to do. So add the 1 across. Um, I'm going to come over to this side. So I've got 1 plus or minus square root x minus 2. And this is my f inverse. So there's my new notation. You all with me? OK. Now we have to do some thinking. So back up here, let me slide down so we can see our graph. We restricted the domain of f so that it was just to the right side. So there is my domain of f. And if I just wanted to talk about the range of f, so the y values I get out are from, it looks like, 2 and on. 2 and bigger. Okay. So when I come down to my inverse function, the domain and range, they swap roles. Okay. So down here for my inverse, the domain of f inverse, oh, f inverse should be down here. The domain of f inverse is whatever the range was up here. So that's going to be 2 to infinity. And the range of f inverse is the domain from before. Okay. So if I want my y values to fit this, if I want my range to be 1 and bigger, when I look at this expression, that means I'm only going to take the positive root, because that will take me 1, and then I will only be adding on 0 or bigger. Okay. If I leave the minus in there, oh, 
I leave the minus in there, then I might potentially be subtracting off of the 1, and that wouldn't match up. So I'm only going to take the positive root, and I'm going to write my final answer. I can squeeze it in right here. Final answer, f inverse of x equals 1 plus radical x minus 2. You should note that the domain of this radical function, 2 has to, or I'm sorry, x has to be 2 or bigger, which matches up with what we had before. Okay, I want to just recap very, very quickly. Highlights for inverse functions. Graphically, it's a reflection over y equals x. Swap x's and y's when you're given a set of ordered pairs. The domain of f is the range of f inverse and vice versa. If you do a composition of a function and its inverse, you get x regardless of what order. And if somehow this is a number, then this is that same number. Okay. And then if f is going to have an inverse function, then f must be one to one.